And what they had in their showroom were copper hard hats and <laughs> pumps. <laughs> and, well, do, do you think I was going to turn down such a good offer as that? No, I found a cave which was big enough to take the equipment. <laughs> No place in Britain has played such a big part in the history of cave diving as Somerset's Wookie Hole. Each new development of equipment or technique has resulted in new extensions. Many world-class cave divers have both trained there and pushed the limits. How fitting then that it should have now become the most technically demanding dive site in the country. In 2003, adventure cameraman Gavin Newman, for an ongoing film about Wookie Hall, set out to reach and to film the exploration limit and depth record set by Rob Parker in 1985. At a depth of 64 metres, the floor finally meets the ceiling, and buried in gravel I can go no further. There's little choice where to aim the camera now, and I struggle to turn it to film what I came to see. I can go no further, but this is not the end. Ahead lies Rob's line reel, a testament not just to the changing nature of the cave, but more to physical and mental abilities. It wasn't to end there when Rick Stanton and John Valentin were shown the footage they identified what could be a missed way on and were soon organising a follow-up trip. There was no way I could follow Rick and John on their exploration dives, so capturing images of the new exploration was going to offer yet another new challenge. The cave was too small and deep for them to take a conventional camera system with them, so I filmed them as far as I could and built a miniature helmet-mounted camera that Rick would wear to film subsequent dives. I've got some gas left. <laughs> well, uh, is, is that a technical diving term, that? Where is some is like enough. Now, a trip to push the limits has become a technical and logistical challenge involving several support divers, the latest technology, and a camp in Chamber 24. Chris Jewell made and filmed his attempt in 2020. So you can see me here placing a silk screw. This is a piece of plastic pipe. And by digging that into the gravel, into the, into the sand, um, I can tie my dive line to it when there's nothing else to tie a dive line to. Whenever I go to this bit of cave, it's quite normal to see that the uh, dive line's been washed out been here a couple of times and the line that I've installed previously has, has never remained. So on this occasion um, I'm installing uh, some thick rope, some thick line. This is some six mil uh, dive line. I've got a homemade reel which you can see me there in the video paying out. You've also noticed of course that I've unclipped one of my cylinders. I'm pushing the cylinder ahead of me because I know that I'm about to get to a fairly uh, low narrow section um, and I need that cylinder taken off. So this really is the first obstacle that you face um, when you get um, into the deep section of this final sump in Wookiee Hole. This is uh, what I call the gravel squeeze. So effectively you've got a very low section of cave. So in order to get through this section, I need to dig my way through the gravel. So I'm going to sort of sweep with my arms and push the gravel out to the sides. And that will make enough space for my body to move forward and then I'll keep repeating that process until I can actually get through. I'm down fairly deep, you know, I'm over 60 metres here. Um, it does take a while uh, to get through this section of cave. Um, it can certainly take, you know, a good 10, maybe sometimes 15 minutes to dig my way through this section um, of the cave. You know, I'm very mindful whenever I'm here that I don't want that gravel to slump back in as well and make it harder um, for me to exit. So although this looks uh, flat, although it looks like I'm horizontal, I'm just uh, looking down uh, to where the cave opens up and uh, yeah, get through there and, and carry on diving. So once you're through that first obstruction, the cave opens up again uh, and it's some, some quite nice cave diving. 
So it's a comfortable passage that I'm swimming along. Um, I'm sort of, you know, 66 odd metres here. So, you know, fairly deep. Um, but the cave is quite nice and open at this point. Um, however, I know that it's not long until I encounter uh, the second obstacle. So this is an actual collapse where uh, the rocks are blocking the way. Um, I actually have to take my cylinders off to attempt to get through this part of the cave. When this part of the cave was first reached by Rick Stanton and John Belanthan, it was impossible for them to get past. And over a series of dives, they opened the way up, uh, eventually by using a lift bag to lift a large rock out of the way. What that means, however, is that to get past this collapse, uh, you still need to squeeze between uh, some boulders. So it's fairly deep, you know, pretty much 70 metres here. I'm having to wriggle down between boulders. Um, and I've actually got to take um, not just one cylinder off this time, but I've got both my cylinders off, bleed of trimix that I'm using. And I'm wriggling down between the rocks here and actually pulling the cylinder down after me. Um, I spent quite a while trying to work out how to get through this bit of cave. Um, you know, I had several attempts. I've been to this point a couple of times and this is the first time I actually managed to get through this bit of cave. When I got through the squeeze, I began to feel quite uncomfortable. I began to get, I guess I can look back with hindsight now and realise I was having some of the effects of CO2 buildup. I couldn't get my breathing properly under control. I knew something wasn't right. I was having some problems with breathing properly. And I decided very rapidly that I wanted to get out of there. So I have a bit of a think about modifying equipment, modifying techniques, and um, you know, let's see if we can have another go at Wookie Hole. Between 2012 and 2015, Martin Farr found that in New Zealand, there were prime diving sites just waiting to be explored. Certainly three years in a row, I found a, a mile of cave on each occasion beyond flooded sections. And when you're a long way out on, on, on a limb, uh, as I was certainly in, on these New Zealand explorations, uh, you have to be ever so careful what you do. Once clear of the silt, the dive is easy and shallow. On the first operation, I quickly pass the sun and explore an ongoing streamway for 400 metres. The passage ends at another sun. It's an extremely intimidating place, but the potential rewards are immense. This next operation, I intend to try and video. I laid 200 metres of line into the ongoing cave and disappointed at the limited progress, returned to look for side passages. I can't believe my luck when I make a six metre ascent to find a large old fossil passage. I'm lost for words as I carefully tiptoe between increasingly beautiful arrays of formations. This is utterly breathtaking. I have been fortunate and privileged to discover some fantastic places over the years, but this must rank amongst the very best. In one case, I passed seven dives. Uh, I remember I found a section of dry cave and I was on my way back and I reached my diving equipment and I just bent down to pick it up uh, and I had a spasm in my back. Uh, and he said, well, no one's going to come and get me because I am the only cave diver in New Zealand at this point in time. The people on the surface know where I am. They know I'm a long way in. But I've told everybody not to call out the rescue 
for 24 hours. Because my philosophy has always been that if I can get myself into a predicament, I am going to get myself out of that cave somewhat one way or another. So I just sort of picked my diving equipment up, put it on, and just grimaced and uh, made my way out. But as my friends in New Zealand would tell you, uh, I couldn't do anything for the next two weeks. I was in a hell of a state, and uh, it was three weeks before I went caving again. English cavers had been exploring caves in the Picos de Europa, northern Spain, for many years. On the Ario mountain, they had discovered many caves descended to depths approaching 2,000 meters. All the water in them emerged in the Carras Gorge at a single rising called the Pozo d'Azur. Since 2001, Jason Mallison had been diving there fully aware of the amazing potential discoveries that the site offered. Having returned year after year, he had pushed huge distances, virtually solo, into some two. It was in 2009 that he had finally needed to call in skilled assistance from all diving partners. The technicality of the diving and the amount of equipment involved had become too great. A team effort was needed. So this was the point when I thought I need some help. So this is when I called in Rick Stanton, John Balanth and Rene Hoogan. I said, we need to do this as a team, because then if one person has a problem, the other people can pick up the slack and have a more chance of extending the end of the line. Now in 2013, when this video was filmed, they were mounting a gigantic operation to go beyond the furthest point reached. First of all, all the equipment had to be manoeuvred through the bottleneck of someone. Streamway posed their own problems. Vital, sometimes heavy life support equipment can so easily be damaged on the sharp jacket rock. Some two proved to be over five kilometers long and 70 meters deep and had finally been passed in 2011. So, sure enough, we got ripped to the end. He surfaced only 160 metres beyond where I got to. Got into a chamber, which he called Tipperary. It was a long way to Tipperary. To push beyond some two and explore some three had presented an enormous logistical, physical and technical challenge. The audacious plan was to set up a camp, an advanced base in Tipperary, beyond the five hour dive to Sump 2. That meant multiple divers had to ferry huge amounts of equipment through this long deep sump with the need to decompress at either end, adding to the complexity of the operation. Sump 3 appeared shallower but was wide open. Nevertheless, distance and decompression remained huge factors. An upturned plastic bin borrowed from the roadside served as a decompression habitat. The operation was to be a hugely successful, well-coordinated team effort by this very experienced and competent team of cave divers. Uh, we camped for one night in the Tipperary and we all did uh, independent pushes in the third sump and it was so successful that trip, it, I think we laid about four kilometres a line. We totted up all the diving we'd done and we realised we'd dive for 8,825 metres in total from the entrance to the furthest point that me and Rick had got to in sump three. And we realised that was further than the, the world record dive in Wakulla. Even though it was built up over three sumps, it's still the sort of uh, uh, the longest penetration dive in the world. So we, we claim that as a world record. In 2011, and we managed to pass the third sump. It turned out to be 3.3 kilometres that sump. Renier passed that first, closely followed by John and Rick, and they, they found a load of waterfalls and cascades climbing up to a fourth sump. And we passed a fourth and a fifth sump and Rennie got past this fifth sump into ongoing dry passage again. Just what we like doing, we like doing multi-sump diving. 
one of the major factors you got to think about is it's, it's all dry suit diving to get to the end. And if that dry suit gets punctured or knackered or the zip goes, you can't repair it in the cave, you're not going to get out. Uh, all cool. All cool, thank you.